Your aircraft is out of control and you have a decision to make. Eject now and it will probably save your trainee pilot's life, but it will most likely kill you. So what do you do? Try not to jump out of your seat as we go over some of the most extreme ejection examples, your chances of survival, and how you can bail out of a helicopter or an airplane that has no ejection seats. And you definitely want to know the number one factor that impacts ejection survival rates, because it's not what you think. On January 6, 1999, a T2C Buckeye, a twin-engine jet trainer, suffered a structural failure that dramatically altered aerodynamics of the aircraft and resulted in loss of control. The instructor initiated ejection in accordance with emergency procedures. The instructor knew that the older T2C aircraft was equipped with first-generation ejection seats, which was inferior to more modern ones. Knowing this, and due to the extreme forces of the death spiral, the instructor's body position was far from ideal. This meant that his chances of survival were slim, and yet, the instructor did not hesitate to save his trainee's life by risking his own. The aftermath was not pretty. The student suffered from a dislocated shoulder, whiplash, mild concussion, and damaged retina of the left eye, which later prevented him from becoming a naval aviator. Devastating. But those were relatively minor injuries compared to that of the instructor, who did manage to make it out alive at the cost of breaking his neck and both legs. Only after several surgeries and months of therapy was he able to walk again. When a pilot realizes that they cannot regain control of the aircraft, the obvious choice is to abandon the vehicle before hitting the ground. But what are the chances of survival after ejection? And what could kill you is not necessarily what you think. The highest altitude ejection occurred when a Lockheed M21 attempted to launch a D-21 drone. The airplane collided with the drone at an altitude of 80,000 feet while traveling at well over three times the speed of sound. The pilot was recovered successfully, but the launch control officer drowned after landing in water. Of the 15 different incidents involving SR-71 and A-12s, 23 of the 26 crew members who ejected made it out alive. The fatalities were attributed to drowning, ejection seat malfunction, or high G-forces. On the flip side, the lowest altitude ejection happened at 15 feet underwater. Yeah. A Royal Navy pilot, Lieutenant Bruce McFarlane, took off from HMS Albion as his engine failed. He luckily survived the water impact, but the aircraft was quickly sinking. His training kicked in and he yanked the canopy jettison handle with his left hand and immediately fired the seat with his right hand. Still submerged, he released his chute and activated his life vest. He finally surfaced aft of the carrier, directly below the rescue helicopter. The helicopter crew reported that if the pilot had ejected only a few seconds later, he would have most likely been killed by the bow of the ship as it sliced the aircraft in half. Talk about good timing. Between 1949 and 1980, a total of 4,626 ejections were recorded by the U.S. military. 838 of those ejections were fatal, resulting in an 82% survival rate. But what was worrisome was that between 1975 and 1980, the survival rate was trending downwards. Investigations concluded that the decreased survival rate was not due to mechanical problems, failure of ejection systems, or improper parachute landing techniques. The primary reason was delayed ejection. Further analysis found a remarkable difference in ejection survival rate during combat time versus peacetime. On the battlefield, pilots reacted quickly and decisively to abandon a damaged airplane. Ejection survival rate during combat was 95%. And yet, in a non-combat situation, a decision to leave a disabled aircraft was not easy to make, perhaps due to psychological factors 
like stigma, ego, and peer pressure. Think about it. When performing a routine training exercise, pilots don't want to be held responsible for destruction of a multi-million dollar aircraft. No wonder they stay as long as possible. With that said, experts believe that the most important reason for delayed ejection was that pilots were so busy trying to regain control of the aircraft that they lost situational awareness of how far off the ground they were. This has historically resulted in delayed ejection attempts or no attempt at all. And altitude is key, and here is why. One study analyzed over 3,000 ejections between 1952 and 1997 and found that of the 2,607 ejections that occurred above 500 feet, survival rate was 91.4%. But out of the 562 low-level ejections that happened below 500 feet, the survival rate was only 51.2%. Another study by the U.S. Department of Defense further breaks down the fatality rate of ejection by altitude. And the difference is striking. Interestingly, a different study analyzed ejection survival rates during takeoff, landing, or while the aircraft was on the ground. It turns out that those ejection scenarios are as safe as ejections above 500 feet and thus do not result in excess injury rates. For example, in 1970, while the F-14 Tomcat was conducting its second test flight, it suffered a hydraulic failure during a landing approach. A mere 100 feet from the ground, the pilots realized that they were not going to make it and ejected. Four seconds later, the prototype Tomcat was gone while the pilots safely made it just outside of the fireball. According to the U.S. Air Force, delaying the decision to eject from an out-of-control aircraft is the single biggest factor in determining the success or failure of in-flight escape. Depending on the sink rate of the aircraft, or in other words, how fast the aircraft is falling to the ground, two to three seconds can make the difference between life and death. Depending on the exact model of the ejection seat, it can take up to 5 seconds for the parachute to be deployed from the time that the ejection sequence was initiated. Additionally, the Air Force notes that ejection seats were not designed to overcome the horrendous sink rates that exceed 600 feet per second. Bottom line is, you don't have much time, especially if your airplane does not have an ejection seat. Airplanes like E-2 Hawkeye and B-52 Bomber sometimes encounter in-flight mishap, like running out of fuel, and the crew have no choice but to abandon ship. But not everyone on those airplanes has an ejection seat. Depending on the exact series, B-52 Stratofortress may not have ejection seats for everyone. For example, B-52C only has ejection seats for the upper deck crew. Spare crew members do not have an ejection seat at all, and they must bail out with parachutes off the aircraft door or jump out of the navigator's hatch only after the navigator has ejected. And in case of the E-2 Hawkeye, there are no ejection seats at all. If there's a problem with the aircraft, there are three options, bail out, ditch, or land. On July 8, 1991, an E-2C catapulted from USS Forrestal in the Mediterranean Sea. Immediately, the starboard engine fire warning light came on. The entire engine was engulfed in flames. As the five-man crew decided to abandon the aircraft, they knew that successful bailout scenarios had not happened before. Nevertheless, they decided to get out before it was too late. The autopilot was engaged and the crew made it to the main entrance door, which was jettisoned. Three naval officers jumped first, followed by two pilots. As all five crew members were being recovered, the Hawkeye kept flying. But before it could become a threat to a populated area, the decision was made to shoot it down. So what about helicopters and passenger jets? Well, the issue of ejecting from a helicopter is that once you eject, you go up, right into the blades of the helicopter, 
which can be detrimental to your health. For this reason, most helicopters do not have an ejection system, but very few do. The world's first helicopter fitted with an ejection seat was the Russian KA-50. The problem of turning pilots into ground meat was solved with an ingenious yet simple solution. Before the ejection seat rocket is deployed, the rotor blades are blown away using explosive charges in the rotor disc, and the canopy is jettisoned. But what about commercial jetliners? Believe it or not, there was one commercial airplane that had ejection seats, but only for the pilots, not the passengers. This was a prototype version of the Soviet Tu-144. I know, it seems completely unfair, but don't worry. In the production version, the problem was solved by removing the pilot's ejection seats. Rumor has it that back in the early days of aviation in the 1920s, it was not uncommon for pilots to bail out from doomed airplanes using parachutes and leaving the passengers behind. That said, we did go through all available public records and no complaints were ever formally submitted by those passengers.